Authentically Jewish transcends religious belief and practice. It extends to every aspect of individual and social life. It embraces history, literature, mythology, art, music, food, culture, language, philosophy, ethics, in short, every aspect of life, which all together would constitute the civilization of a unique people. Our goal is to extend and enlarge our appreciation of our own heritage as Jews, to enlighten our friends and neighbors, and to share with them in the spirit of community, the special meaning of our experience. That sums it up and took us a while to create and with the help of uh, Jeff Oman, who beautifully set it down on paper, we submitted this as our mission statement, and that's what we're st we stand for. Um, I'd like to introduce at this time the members of the board who got us this far. Um, and uh, I'm, I think you'll be when you when I say your name, if you would just raise your hand or wave or whatever. Arlene and Ira Cohn, Adele and Bill Gilman, Leslie and Harvey Finkelstein. Marilyn Sladowski and Larry Shapiro, I presume they're on the same screen, although I can't see them. Honey and Jeff Oman, my wife Arlene, who's sitting next to me. Uh, Bev Bober, our newest board member. And I do wanna give mention to the fact that uh, one of our board members, uh, Jerry Goldberg is not able to be with us, he's quite, ill and we wish him nothing but the best and a speedy recovery and a return to the board as soon as possible. Um, I would like to, uh, at this time, introduce to you the executive director of the Jewish Federation of Somerset, Hunterdon and Warren counties, Robin Wishney. Robin uh, and her uh, colleague, Lauren Edelman uh, and the Jewish Federation were kind enough to co-sponsor this program uh, with us. And we look forward to doing that again in the future uh, as we do with the Hadassah of Canal Walk, which we've also already had an opportunity to join and participate with them. So without further ado, I introduce to you Robin Wishney, who is, as I said, the Executive Director of the Jewish Federation of Somerset, Hunterdon and Warren counties. Thank you so much, Bert. It's so wonderful to be here this morning with all of you. We at the Jude Jewish Federation of Somerset, Hunter and Warren counties are so pleased to be presenting this program in partnership with the Canal Walk Jewish American Culture Club. Um, the Federation is dedicated to bringing programs with topics of interest to the Jewish community. And we have a number of upcoming programs that may interest you since this one was of interest to all of you who, who are here this morning. Um, including a virtual visit to Yemen or Youth Village, which is one of our beneficiary agencies in Israel and is dedicated to educating youth at risk and raising the next generation of leaders in Israel. And that program is on January 24th. We will also be going on a virtual mission to Latin America on May 5th, learning about uh, the Jewish communities all around Latin America that many people may not even be aware um, exist. Um, so if Jewish communities around the world are of interest to you and you would like the opportunity to hear from them and learn about them, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, information about these programs and many others can be found on our website, which we will put in the chat, uh, but it's jfedshaw.org. You can also sign up for our newsletter when you're on our website to receive information about all kinds of programs going forward. But beyond bringing some really wonderful programming to our community, the mission of the Federation is to care for those in need, to fight anti-Semitism and to promote a uh, community. We do this based on our Jewish values and we care for anyone who comes to us. We provide all sorts of services from mental health counseling to special needs programming, to food shopping for seniors and social programs for Holocaust survivors. During the pandemic, we funded the purchase of personal protective equipment for the Wolf Campus for Senior Living for both caregivers and residents. The Federation was also instrumental in, ensure, in ensuring that the doors of our Jewish communal institutions stayed open so that they could safely provide the services that are so vitally needed at this particular time. Um, 
This is just a taste of what our community accomplishes by working together under the Federation umbrella. And if you'd like to learn more about the impact of our work, you can go to the website, as I mentioned earlier, jfedshaw.org, or ask any <laughs> member of the Culture Club's executive committee. They all have my email address and can connect us. Um, so once again, we're thrilled to be doing this with you. I know you're going to love the program. Um, our presenter today, Peter, is a friend of our Federation and a friend of mine personally. And I know you're going to just love hearing what he has to say. So thank you all for welcoming us and for allowing us to share this inaugural event with you. Um, and with that, I'll send the program over to Jeffrey Ullman. Jeffrey. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. Virtually the whole of Western civilization arises fundamentally from the contributions of two of the world's most ancient peoples, the Greeks and the Jews. The Greeks taught us that the universe was coherent and amenable to rational investigation. They laid the foundations for the kind of systematic inquiry we call today the scientific method and contributed virtually all of the vocabulary of modern science. And of course, they gave us both the word democracy and the idea of self-governance. To the Jews, civilization owes an equally powerful and dynamic understanding of the order of the world, albeit an order of a very different kind from the Greek notion. The order of the universe to the Jewish understanding is primarily a moral order as imposed upon a chaotic world by a singular living God, a God of justice in whose image mankind is created. Virtually everything we believe about the universe and our place in it, about how we ought to behave and relate toward one another, about how human beings may rightfully be organized in civil society, derives from and is traceable back to one or the other of these great traditions and peoples. The idea of political governance in which power flows up from the governed and not down from a divinely anointed king, for example, is fundamentally Greek. The idea that justice cannot exist unless there is but one manner of law for all people, all of whom stand as equals before it, as they are equal before God, is distinctively Jewish. Moreover, substantial cultural cross-pollination between these civilizations arose in the ancient world, particularly in the centuries after Alexander the Great's conquest of Egypt, Syria, and the whole of modern Israel, almost 400 years before the beginning of the Common Era. As Rabbi James Panette, Yale's Jewish chaplain has noted, the Jews at first resisted the Greek invasion, then succumbed to it, then were transformed by it. Key words of Jewish self-understanding are still carried by Greek in the collective Jewish memory. These include synagogue, diaspora, Sanhedrin, the afikomen we search for after the Passover meal, even the word Judaism itself. The rabbis who would later write the Jerusalem Talmud in the first and second century, not infrequently invoked Greek Gentiles as models of Jewish principle and behavior, and they debated whether a man should teach his daughter how to read Greek. It is altogether fitting, therefore, that the story of the Greeks and the story of the Jews and their interactions with one another is a really good place for us to start our explorations of Jewish heritage and culture. Today, therefore, we are very pleased to present Dr. Peter Stavrianidis, and his discussion of the untold story of the Greek Jews, a journey of glory, tradition, and struggle for survival. Dr. Stavrianidis holds a BBA and MBA from Baruch College of the City University of New York, a PhD in political sociology from Pantheon University in Athens, and a multitude of designations and diplomas in the fields of gemology, evaluation of precious metals and minerals. He is a distinguished entrepreneur, the principal of the fourth generation family business, Venus Jewelers and Gemologists, located right here in Somerset, New Jersey. He is a frequent lecturer and a widely respected community leader and academic researcher. And adding to his many accolades, he was just recently appointed to the Commission of Culture and Heritage for Somerset County, having been sworn into that prestigious position on January 3rd. We are delighted to have Dr. Peter with us this morning his presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You are invited to send in your questions using the chat feature of Zoom, which we explained to you in the invitation. Without further ado then, we present Dr. Peter Stavrianidis and the untold story of the Greek Jews.
Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. And uh, as a segue uh, to your introduction, I would like to say something that probably most of you didn't know, that the only other language that a Jew is allowed to pray besides Hebrew is Greek. Did you know that? I'm sure you didn't. I didn't know myself, uh, but I, during my research, when I was talking to a lot of my uh, Greek Jewish compatriots, I was able to uh, find that out. And there's a long story behind it, but today, I, well, first of all, let me thank the, uh, the Cannot Walk uh, Jewish uh, Culture and Heritage Association and the Jewish Federation of Somerset for giving me this opportunity to talk about a topic which is very dear to my heart, but it's not widely known. Uh, if we were presenting this topic live, which I have quite a few times, the first thing I would ask you is how many of you knew that there is such a thing as a Greek Jew? And probably most of you wouldn't raise your hands. Well, in fact, Jews have been existing in the Balkan Peninsula, and especially in the region that is today called Greece, since time immemorial, since antiquity. Uh, this is the first time that I'm presenting uh, this presentation virtually, and honestly, I had to, to revise it carefully, make it shorter, uh, not too academic, although it is an academic research, and it, it, it is not going to be a lecture. Uh, it will be a journey through time, a journey through time, covering the most important periods and events that played a role in the existence of Jewish people in Greece. Uh, first, I will give you an overview of the historiography and then I will give you some, I will share with you some of my findings pertaining to the status of the remaining tiny but very broad, vibrant Greek Jewish community. And last and, and certainly not least, I will conclude my, by expressing some of my concerns, but also the hopes of this community or a brighter future. So let's begin. Why, you know, people ask me, why, what's the point of studying the Jews of Greece? Uh, I think it is a very unique ethno-religious group. Uh, not too many academic studies have addressed their concerns. Also, just like most of the countries in Europe, there is anti-Semitism. It's a different type of anti-Semitism, but there is. Uh, and also to enlighten current educators and political leaders about their role as citizens in the contemporary history of the Hellenic Republic. The research questions to determine the level of acculturation and assimilation of Greek Jews, to determine Greek Jews' perception of their identity in contemporary Greece and, and the methods that they use to preserve it. And also, as I mentioned be, before, to determine the level and the type of uh, anti-Semitism in contemporary Greece. There are two major uh, Greek Jewish um, sections. One is the Romaniot Jews. Those are the ancient, if I may use this, uh, this term, the ancient Greek Jews, the Hellenized Jews, and the Sephardic Jews that came later uh, 
at the time of in, uh, Spanish Inquisition in 1492. And those are the majority. The Ashkenazi Jews, it's an it's insignificant uh, uh, community, which uh, at this point, I don't think uh, it's worth mentioning because they're just very few. So here we have some signs from the past that indicate that Jews have been in Greece uh, for thousands of years. Uh, for those of you uh, that have visited the Greek islands, Aegina is one of the smaller Greek islands, very close to Athens. And here uh, you can see the mosaic floor of an ancient synagogue in this small, in this small island, which is probably around fourth century uh, common era. Here is another tiny island where we can see the obvious remains of a synagogue uh, in the island of Pilos. And it's the oldest synagogue known today, uh, its origin dating between 150 and 120. 28 BCE. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Roman Jews, which are, I would say, the most Hellenized Jews, at least till about World War II. They, they do speak a, a dialect of, of Greek, which is called Yavanic. And Ioannina or Yanna as you see over here, is the major city where they have existed. And there was a time in the beginning of the 20th century that there was a pretty substantial community there of about 4,000 people. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would like to mention that today the mayor of Yanina is uh, Dr. Elisaf, Moses Elisaf, who is a medical doctor. He's an academic and is a, a, a politician also. Uh, so this is, this is the original, if I may call the original Jews that existed in antiquity in what region today is the uh, country of Greece. And then of course, we have the Sephardi Jews that were expelled from Spain in 1492. And many of them moved to Northern Greece. And here you can see as they left from Spain, some of them went to the Italian peninsula. Some of them went to Northern Africa and also the coast of the Ottoman Empire at the time. Many of them went to Thessaloniki or Salonika as it was called those days. Now, uh, just let me tell you a couple of things about the Ottoman administrative, economic and political system. The, the Ottoman Empire was organized around ethno-religious groups called millets, each of which was largely self-governing. Thus the various sects and the various Jewish sects and the Shiites were each governed by their own law, courts, etc. Now, what, what does it mean? It means that they did have a, a, a certain degree of autonomy, but they never had the opportunity to be first-class citizens and to enjoy the privileges that the Sunni Muslims, Muslim citizens of the Ottoman Empire could enjoy. And uh, as many of you know, 
the Ottoman Empire at the time, uh, it, it had a, a, it, there was existed a great diversity of religions and ethnicities. So this is the Orthodox Christian millet or the Greek millet. Uh, and the leader, the patriarch, uh, was and still is based in Constantinople or Istanbul. And here is the Jewish millet. I was led by the chief rabbi in Istanbul. And here's the Armenian millet. So here's a, this is a picture, a slide of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century until about the beginning of the 20th century. And here we see three major centers of Greek Jewish communities. One of them is Salonika, the other is Izmir, and the other is Constantinople. Those are three major uh, Jewish communities during the Ottoman Empire. And still in Salonika, there is a remaining small but vibrant community of about between 1,000 and 1,500 uh, Greek Jews. Now, just uh, parenthetically, because sometimes in my audience, uh, there's some people, uh, they don't understand what Zionism is. So I just have here some basic, basic terminology about Zionism. And the reason, the reason I'm including this because there was a significant Zionist movement, especially in the city of Salonika, where there were some prominent um, Jewish uh, people of um, letters and culture. And of course, that's an entire uh, lecture of its own, but due to the constraints of time, we can cover hopefully sometime in the future. So here, I'm just giving you an idea about the demographics of the Ottoman Empire uh, during that period. So, uh, and in here with this uh, census was taken in 1906. And we see that the Jewish community is a small community. It's only 1.24% of the, um, of the, what is the total? There's about 20 million in the Ottoman Empire at the time. So there was only about 250,000 Jews, but they played a significant role. And here, I'm just giving you a demographics of Salonika, which was the major city where uh, Jews uh, lived for hundreds of years, speaking the Sephardi too. So you see here, they don't have the majority, but they do have the plurality here with 61,000 uh, uh, citizens living in Salonika in 1913. Now, this is a significant event which took place uh, in uh, October 26 of 1912, where Salonika, which until that time was part of the Ottoman Empire, of uh, was uh, liberated, if I may use this term, by the Greek army. And, and what happens is overnight, the, the Jewish population from being Ottoman subjects, they become Greek subjects. But what, what does this mean? 
it it is a privilege and, and, and also a responsibility because automatically they become uh, first class citizens like uh, everybody else, every other uh, citizen, which is um, in in that section that the section that's part of Greece at the time. And but at the same time, they have to abide by the rules and regulations. In, in other words, just to give you an idea, up until that time, because they had uh, a certain degree of autonomy, they would close on Saturdays to celebrate the Shabbat. And, uh, but under, under the new country, now they become, and I'm talking about the Sephardic Jews because there's also the Roman Jews. Now, the Sephardic Jews at this time, in 1912, they mostly do not speak Greek and mostly they speak Ladino, which is a, a, a Hispanic, a Spanish uh, dialect. I'm, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Okay, so what happens at this point? They have to be gradually Hellenized. When I say Hellenized, I don't mean that they have to embrace the Christian Orthodox religion, but at least to uh, learn the language and to acculturate to their new country that gives them the opportunity to be uh, full citizens in every sense of the word. So uh, until World War II, the Sephardic Jews go through a period of acculturation and Hellenization. However, especially the Salonican Jews, it's not enough time to be fully acculturated and Hellenized. Here's some pictures of families. And uh, here we see uh, Salonican Jews, which whose most of them still live in a ghetto type situation, as opposed to the Romanian Jews who are completely Hellenized, they speak the language. So you cannot distinguish them from the other Greek citizens as opposed to, to the Salonica Jews that, as I said, most of them are not fully Hellenized. Even you can detect they're Jewish from the way they speak, the way they dress, etc. Here we see a Hellenized Greek Jew who is actually, uh, most of them live, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, in Ioannina or Yanina. I just give you a couple of uh, seconds for you to read. So as you see, uh, outside their homes, there was no difference. You couldn't tell the difference, but they still maintained the culture, the Jewish culture, and most of all, the Jewish religion. And here we find the Greek Jewish uh, community participating as every other Greek fighting the uh, the fascist Italy and the Nazi Germany. Uh, here is one of the first Greek officers, Mordecai Frizis, a colonel who died in the Albanian front on his horse, leading his troops against the forces of the Axis. That said, 513 Greek Jews gave their lives and 3,500 would return severely injured. 
and this is the sad, a sad chapter of the of the fate of the Greek Jews in in Greece, especially in Salonika, where, as you see, from the seventy seven thousand plus of the of the Greek Jewish population, about eighty seven percent was lost. Just showing you slides from um, uh, the Greek Jewish population in Thessaloniki as they are about to embark a train that would take them to Auschwitz, Birkenau. And it happened in the summer of 1942, the persecution of the Jews. And uh, the Germans tricked, especially the Salonican Jews, they tricked them. Uh, it was, uh, and you know, many times people ask me, how can it be 94% of Salonican Jews never returned? And, and of course, that's, that's a whole lecture of its own, but quickly, quickly, in a few minutes, um, I mean, there, there's several contributing factors. It was lack of leadership. There was also an amount of uh, apathy from the local uh, Greek uh, uh, Christian uh, citizens of uh, Salonika. And, and of course, uh, you know, I can talk about it for, for an hour at least, but at this point, uh, these are the, but mostly I would say it was leadership. It, it was a Jewish leadership, uh, especially their chief rabbi who believed, believed, and, and actually who wasn't even a Sephardic Jew. Uh, he was an Ashkenazi Jew and he spoke uh, German uh, perfectly. So uh, somehow the Germans convinced him that they would go to Poland and they would work there. But little did they know. So uh, here we have the sad results of this uh, dark period in the history, not only of Greece, but mankind. And they, many of them participated in the resistance. As a matter of fact, the resistance forces, I have to mention that, uh, they were begging, especially the Salonican Jews, to join them in the mountains. But most of them, some of them, uh, did join them and they, they, were, they survived. But most of them wanted to stay with their families, wanted to stay with the elderly. You know, it's the, that tight, uh, traditional uh, Jewish uh, family ties that exist that then allow them to abandon them and go to the mountains and join the partisan, the resistant, resistance. This is one of the heroic, I would say, incidents where there's the Greek island of Zakynthos, which is the, on the Ionian Sea, which is the islands. There's Corfu there, and there's uh, Zakynthos, and there's Ithaca, and there's a couple of other, there's seven uh, pretty substantial islands there, which is between Greece and uh, Italy. So Zakynthos is one of them. And the, the Jews that lived there were the Roman Jews. They, the more Hellenized Jews, the Jews that lived there for millennia. So what happened is the German officials demanded a list of the island's Jewish residents. So the mayor turned to local Greek Orthodox Bishop Chrysostomus for help. So the bishop negotiated for their lives and uh, about 200 Jews fled to remote local villages where non-Jewish locals hid them. So when the, the, the Germans again demanded the names for deportation, 
the mayor and, and, and the, the bishop presented a list bearing only two names, their names, the mayors and the bishops. At war's end, all 275 of Zakynthus Jews were still alive. Another thing that the, the, the Orthodox Church, one of the actions that they took, they instructed the Greek clergy to supply false baptismal certificates to Jews in order to protect them. And here also, Angelos Evert, who was the chief of police at the time, also uh, did whatever he could do to, uh, and uh, he uh, provided, provided uh, forged identity cards with Christian names to uh, Athenian uh, Jewish citizens. So many of them were survived in that uh, uh, manner. So this is this is a picture of, of uh, contemporary Greece. Uh, as you see, um, there's several um, situations that exist. One, one of them is uh, the, the the Greek Orthodox Christians are ninety eight percent, and then you have the uh, Muslim minority, and then you do have the the remaining tiny but vibrant Greek Jewish community. So we, there's about five to five and a half thousand Greek Jews. So uh, this, this for those of you that do a little bit about academia, uh, you start with your research with some hypothesis. So these are my hypothesis that the Greek Jewish community is diminishing that the Greek Jewish community is not 100% accepted by the Greek homogenous society, that anti-Semitism exists and on the rise in Greece. Majority of Greek Jews view Israel as their historic and spiritual motherland. Greek Jews are fully acculturated, but mostly not assimilated. When I say assimilated, a complete assimilation includes also espousing the, uh, the religion of the host country. So just to give you an example, uh, many immigrants when they uh, migrated to the United States in order to be fully assimilated and accepted back in the day, I'm talking probably a hundred years ago, not only that they, they uh, became acculturated, but many of them also espoused uh, the Protestant religion. So, and the last hypothesis is that Greek Jews are unique as compared to other European and American Jews. So this is the method that I used. Questionnaires and uh, semi-structure interviews. So as you see here, and I'm sure you're not surprised that at least 82%, 82% had at least a bachelor's degree. So uh, we're talking about a very well-educated uh, part of uh, Greek society. And 60% uh, 60, 60 of my subjects were married of which uh, 63 percent married to a Jew. And here's the questionnaire that asks, um, and I do have the uh, pies here that indicate how the percentages uh, show. This is also questionnaire results. 96% I do associate socially with their Christian Greek compatriots. 92% have visited Israel 
at least once. If I were, if we had this, uh, this uh, presentation live, I would ask you to show me how many of you, just to get an idea of the percentage that have visited Israel. I'm sure most of you have, at least this particular audience. Uh, and of course, you see how they answered to the rest of the questions. 55% uh, felt close, very closely to Israel. Half of them, 50%, felt that, that anti-Semitism is becoming a serious problem. Half of them had uh, experienced a moderate amount of anti-Semitism. And most of them believe that anti-Semitism increase will increase. These are some of the Jewish organizations uh, in, in Greece. I had the opportunity to visit all of them. If, even Chabad of Greece, I, I had an audience with a couple of times with the rabbi at Chabad, but also all the other uh, Greek Jewish organizations, including the kosher restaurant in Athens. So if you are ever in Athens, please visit and support the only one, the only kosher restaurant that exists in Athens. So here I'm making a comparison uh, between Jewish Greek and Jewish Americans. And uh, globally, we had 13.8 million of Jews, United States 6.8, Israel 6.18. The Greek Jews, they're secular. Uh, I mean, although, although some of them answered that they're conservative, I trust me, uh, most of them are secular. They do go to the synagogue. Um, most of them, they go either for a wedding or during the high ho holidays, uh, but most of them are secular. But very connected to the culture, to the Jewish culture, okay? I want to emphasize that, very much connected and very proud. So here, you see the intermarriage rate. And if I were to say the biggest concern, everything else is becoming better. Even anti-Semitism is not as bad as it used to be a few years ago when I started my research. But the biggest concern is the intermarriage. And I'm sure uh, this is the biggest concern here in the States, which is, uh, you know, it's, I'm sure it's mostly accepted by most of you. It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's evolution. That's what I would say. How close do you feel attached you feel to Israel? Jewish Greeks, I guess because it's a small community of 55% uh, answered as opposed to Jewish Americans who 30%. Have you ever been to Israel? 92% of Jewish Greeks have been to Israel. From the Jewish Americans, 42%. And then I interviewed actually 50, uh, 50 individuals, and that was very interesting. They were from diverse back backgrounds, and uh, most of them, as I said before, they were very proud 
to of their Jewish I, identity. Um, they felt, most of them felt that they're minority in Greece, but they, they didn't feel that they're marginalized. And some of them felt that they were, that they were disadvantaged, especially uh, at a younger age when they served in the army. But those are from, from a, a previous generation. The younger people that I interviewed, they assured me that they did not feel uh, at all uh, any type of anti-Semitism, whether they were in school or even when they served in the uh, armed forces of Greece. So as you see here, especially before we had private um, uh, interviews with uh, the agreement that they will remain anonymous, they were quite open. So some of them expressed that they did experience uh, anti-Semitism, not exactly, it was not a violent physical or verbal anti-Semitism, but, but the anti-Semitism that exists in Greece is based on uh, mostly, I would say, on religious, not official religious items, because the official, uh, the official position of the church is 100% against anti-Semitism. I'll give you a few minutes just to go through the question, questions and answers. So uh, I would like in the future to spend or to, uh, for us to have a, a lecture about anti-Semitism, what it means, because over the, over the years, it has taken uh, different forms. And um, I think it's something that's worthwhile uh, to, I've done a lot of research on that. So if you give me the opportunity in the future, I would like to make a presentation on that. <clears throat> so all of the interviews expressed that they felt closer to Greece. Uh, the vast majority, 85% consider Greece as their motherland. As some interviews viewed Israel as their historical um, motherland. Now, what, what are some of the concerns for the future of the uh, Greek Jews? One of them is non-acceptance as full Greek citizens. And of course, some, some people might ask me, why do you say that? Well, because there's um, part of the modern Greek historiography don't forget Greece, actually this year, Greece is celebrating 200 years of the liberation of the country, of the genesis of the modern Greek nation in a, from in 1821, which was the, the revolution against the Ottoman Empire took place. So most of the history books claim, of course, this is changing, that in order to be a full Greek, you have to be Greek Orthodox Christian. That is definitely changing. And Greece today has become much more multicultural as uh, 
part of the European Union. So the other thing, fear of increasing anti-Semitism. As I, as I said before, uh, I have seen doing my research, I had to change uh, many of my views. Uh, Anti-Semitism is not what it used to be back uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. I think the biggest, <clears throat> the biggest fear or concern, if you will, of the, uh, during my interviews of the Greek Jewish community was intermarriage. Uh, because uh, with intermarriage, there's two possibilities, actually three possibilities. As you, most of you very well know, one possibility is for the person who is from the Christian, the Orthodox Christian community to espouse Judaism. Statistically wise, and not only in our case, but in most of the cases, the host country, the population of the host country has advantage vis-a-vis -vis the minority. So the other possibility is uh, for the Jewish person to espouse Christianity. And the other third possibility is just to remain neutral, completely secular, and allow their children to make their choice. Uh, so the, the other concern is the complete secularization of the new generation. In other words, you remain a Jew, but you just, you're not concerned and you're not <clears throat> connected. And last, and not certainly not least is the economic insecurity that exists right now. And uh, it has uh, impact, it has had impact in every section of society in Greece and of course uh, in Europe in general. And this is the end of my presentation. Um, and the few, the few um, ending words that I would like to say that, um, first of all, I would take your questions and I will answer them to the best of my ability. But uh, having done this, um, this research, which I'm still working on it, I'm still not completely, uh, I haven't completely finished it, but I saw, I had the opportunity to meet with some very important uh, Greek uh, uh, Jewish individuals uh, in Greece. And uh, I was very happy to see that uh, th at this point, there's a breath of fresh air. Uh, Greece is becoming more multicultural and uh, the Greek Jews feel at least almost all of them they feel safe. Uh, as a matter of fact, a few of them said, you know something, if I lived in, in, in another country in Europe without mentioning the names, I would also have my luggage ready to go, ready to go to Israel, of course. But here, I don't have to do that because I feel that yes, there is uh, some time on anti-Semitism, which is different. It's different than other countries in Europe. And it's different than the type of anti-Semitists that exists here, but they don't feel threatened physically or in any other way. So I will conclude here in order to, uh, because of the constraints of time, I understand this is a, a virtual uh, presentation. I hope I did well. This is the first time I'm doing this. I'm better in person. <laughs> Trust me, I am. So please uh, pose your questions and I hope I'll be able to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I'm Shana Sherman, the campaign manager for the Jewish Federation of Somerset, Hunterdon and Warren counties. And we have some really fantastic uh, questions in the chat. So if everyone wants to, to hang with us uh, for some questions, Peter, do you want to go ahead and unshare your screen? 
Uh, let's see. Uh, what do I do? All righty. So, um, can you bring your share? Your okay. Perfect. Is that Thank good? Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so we have a lot of great questions. Uh, I I had the chance, um, which I, I think I told you a few months back via email, to visit Greece for the first time, uh, in right before everything kind of shut down, and uh, and it was a really incredible experience. Um, and I was also working for the Federation's critical global and overseas partner, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, uh, which through which our very own community here in the Somerset area helped the Greek Jews in particular through the recent financial crisis, uh, through personal grants and uh, making sure that their institutions were, were able to stay open. So um, really proud to be, to be here with you today and um, what a beautiful presentation. Um, so we have, we have a few great questions. Um, the, the first one that, that is very specific to, to one slide that you showed um, is from Burton. Um, and he asked, would it be correct to assume that the Salonican Jews are more observant than other Greek sects of Judaism? Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. Uh, I wouldn't say this at this point, no. Uh, I, I have visited uh, the community in, 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 in Thessaloniki, which is the uh, modern term, actually it's the original uh, name of the city. And I have visited the community in Athens, which is a very vibrant community because today, uh, most of the Greek Jews live, live in Athens. In uh, Salonika, there's about a thousand. Uh, very well established, okay? Most of them very well to do and very well educated. In Greece, it's more youthful. I mean, in Athens, it's more youthful. They have a very young rabbi He's, uh, I think it's 30 or 31 years old. Uh, his name is uh, Gabriel Negri, very talented. Uh, he has studied uh, in the Greek university and he did uh, also, he has studied in Israel and Tel Aviv. Uh, he's, uh, look him up uh, and he's a friend of mine and he's, uh, he's extraordinary. He's very spiritual, young. Uh, he goes to different parts of, of Athens on his uh, motorcycle. So you can, it's, I'm telling you, he's an incredible guy. So I wouldn't say, I would say, and of course I visited the community at Corfu. There's only about a hundred left in Corfu. And I spoke with the president there. That was last year in 2019, right? So I wouldn't say that at this point. I wouldn't say, I would say that wherever there's a, a Jewish population. They're just as connected to the, their synagogue as, as much as any other Jew in Greece. So we don't have data to support that. Okay. I hope I, I Thank answered you. the question. You answered that question and about three or four other ones that people had asked about exactly. where the populations are based and so on. So thank you for that. Um, you know, you shared that, that Anti-Semitism generally, you know, is not a, a constant stream through people's lives right now. It seemed, how, are there any specific examples of how anti-Semitism has been manifesting itself recently yeah. in Greece? Yeah, uh, usually uh, the incidents that we, we see with anti-Semitism is uh, vandalizing uh, cemeteries or monuments that exist, that pertain to, uh, to Jews, you know, that, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, this is condemned by the overwhelming majority of the media and the church and the political leadership. So as a matter of fact, uh, some of the political leaders uh, that were to the ultra right and in, in the past, uh, have expressed uh, anti-Semitic um, remarks, they, uh, they had to ask for forgiveness. And uh, okay. that is to their, to their credit. So at this point, 
any anti-Semitic remark would be automatically condemned. But yes, still, occasionally, you would see, uh, you know, the usual stuff. Uh, you know, somebody would go to the cemeteries and put the uh, Nazi, Nazi symbols or something like this, which we see in other parts of the world as much. That's why I think we should have some time in the future. Oh, by the way, before I forget, there is an excellent movie that is called Cloudy Sunday. And it's, it's a very sad, but very well made movie about Salonican Jews during the Holocaust. And I would love to be able sometime in the future to show the movie and then I can make certain remarks about the Salonican Jews and the Holocaust, what took place during that time. So we can do this at the Federation or we can also do it at Canal Walk when things go back to more normal. <laughs> Amen. That sounds that sounds great. Um, we have an um, an interesting question that I'll just put my my Jewish educator hat on for a second. Um, Nadine asks uh, earlier, can Jews pray in English? And I'll say, from my kind of understanding, that's really based on the community that you're from uh, and uh, the the kind of type, you know, the, whether you're Reform or Conservative or Orthodox, but around the world, Jews pray in whatever language they're speaking. So whether we're talking about in Athens or in Georgia, the state or Georgia, the country, they're praying in the language that's native to them, plus Hebrew or something called Ladino. There's, there's a few different languages that Jewish communities might speak around the world. Um, Peter, could you speak a little bit from a historical perspective? What language were, were the Jews speaking when you first started your presentation thousands of years ago? And how about now? the language that I communicated with the, with the Greek yes. Jews. Of course, it was Greek. Yes. Yeah, it was Greek. And were they, were they, were they pray in Greek? Excuse me? Or in Hebrew? It, what language were they praying? Oh, uh, okay. That, I'm not, uh, I'm not a theologian, so, uh, but I was told by a prominent uh, Greek Jewish person, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, his wife has written uh, many books about the Holocaust, the Greek uh, Jewish Holocaust, etc. that uh, he brought it to my attention. So from, I guess from the rabbinical point of view, if I may use this term, that the, 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 the language that you pray is, uh, is Hebrew. I'm not sure about the Aramaic. I'm sure that he said Hebrew and Greek, because if we go back to the Jews of Alexandria who were completely Hellenized, meaning that they only spoke uh, Greek, that they had lost their religion. And at the time, uh, Ptolemy, uh, who was the pharaoh of Egypt, provided them with the Septuagint. I'm sure you know that. Uh, the 70 uh, wise men who translated from ancient Hebrew and Aramaic to uh, the Alexandrian Greek for them to find their religion again. And I think that's what contributed uh, that Greek has become, besides becoming a, a language of the gospel, it has become also a language of the Torah. But again, we can uh, double check on this in the near future and see Thank how true it is. So I have, I have two or three more questions. Uh, one is, is there general professions that Greek Jews are, are found in or are very much involved in in Greek culture? Okay, that, that's a good question. And, and then if I go to uh, a couple of generations before, um, most of them are in business. Okay, most of them are in business. And, uh, but today um, I saw, I spoke to quite a few younger people, millennials, who are, some of them are academics, uh, some of them are in, in IT, and uh, some of them are musicians, a few of them. And uh, so things have changed, but <clears throat> back, uh, back in the day, like in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, 
most of the Jews were in business. They, had, they were connected with some kind of a business. But the, the good news is that, as I said, 82% have at least a bachelor's degree. Right. I'm not sure what the equivalent is uh, with American Jews, uh, but that's very high. That's very impressive. And uh, some of them have uh, um, immigrated to the United States. Uh, they, oh, by the way, there's a Greek Jewish synagogue downtown in Chinatown. Okay, so just uh, if you ever would like to visit, I will get in touch with my friend, Marsha Haddad, who is the director. It's also a museum. And they still, they still conduct uh, the liturgy in Judeo-Greek. Okay, so it is half Hebrew, half Greek. The, the other thing I wanted to tell you that about the uniqueness of Greek Jews, even during the Holocaust, when they first went to the uh, Birkenau in Auschwitz, the Ashkenazi Jews did not accept them because they did not speak Yiddish and they did not speak German or Polish, but they spoke Greek they spoke Ladino and they spoke Hebrew as opposed to the Ashkenazi who didn't. So <clears throat> they were not fully accepted and they were more patriotic than the other Jews uh, in which ways? In other words, like uh, there was, uh, and this is written, this is part of the academia that uh, hundreds of Jews, they died in the chambers, uh, singing the Greek national anthem. And this is something unique, something that I don't see, I have read, let's say from the Polish Jews or the German Jews, and for obvious reasons, I guess, for obvious reasons. So I just wanted, I just wanted to throw that in there to uh, explain and express the uniqueness of the Greek Jews. Great. Um, I have uh, I have one question that maybe we can answer quickly, and then another one that'll kind of tie it all together. I think so. First, you talked about the personal relationships between is uh, that people feel about Israel, Greek people, Jews, Jews feel about Israel. What is the current political relationship between Israel and Greece? It's uh, Dave, thank you for asking this question. Uh, it's the best that has ever been. I mean, the alliance, I, 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 I can spend a whole lecture on that, but the alliance, alliance that exists now uh, between Greece and Israel is phenomenal in every way, uh, militarily, uh, in commerce, education and culture. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, there is a Holocaust museum that is in the process of being built in Salonika, okay? Yeah. And uh, there is thousands and thousands of Israelis who uh, visit uh, Greece and uh, they have changed uh, other places of uh, destination. I don't, I don't want to mention the countries where they used to go and now they decided to switch and most of them come to Greece. There's a tremendous cultural musical connection between Greece and Israel, and I'm sure most of you have gone to Israel and you can hear uh, Greek music with uh, uh, Hebrew words. And uh, that's amazing. And so there's a, a trem tremendous uh, cultural connection uh, between Greece and Israel now. So I hope I was able to answer your question, that question. So, so one more question to tie it all together. Carolyn asked, about the Greek population, the Greek Jewish population here in New Jersey. Any, any notes you want to share about that? Uh, the, 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 the most of them I will, I usually meet during, of course, during the year, if they invite me to do a lecture, I've done a lecture 
in the uh, Greek Jewish synagogue downtown uh, in the city. And most of them I, I meet during the high holidays when they invite me. There isn't too many in New Jersey that I'm aware of, but there's definitely quite a few uh, in Manhattan, in Queens, and uh, in Long Island. That's where most of my Greek Jewish friends are located. Okay, thank you so much. So I am going to turn it over to Bert and thanks again for being here. You're muted. Okay, now I can, I got it. Peter, first of all, it was an absolutely fascinating, interesting, beyond interesting lecture. I personally have learned things that I never knew before about the Greek Jews, uh, and I thank you for that. And we look forward to having you in the future for some additional programs. Um, Lauren and Robin, I thank you from on behalf of the club uh, and Shana uh, for all of the uh, participation, for helping us get this program off the ground and for making it a very, very enjoyable uh, morning. And I. Trust we all look forward again to having additional contact with you and programs and sharing these types of events. Uh, to those of you who came as attendees, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, our our uh, club meets or is scheduled to meet uh, the last Sunday of every other month. Uh, initially, before the pandemic, our intention was to have everybody at the clubhouse uh, we'd have some bagels and coffee and then have a program. And that's the format that we're going to be following, God willing, once this pandemic issue is behind us. So I look forward to seeing all of you face to face. Uh, we have membership applications available from Marilyn Slodowski. They actually also have them in the main office of Canal Walk at the clubhouse. Uh, we'd look forward to your joining with us in the future. Uh, and I thank all of you for just a lovely, lovely morning. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to.